I want to welcome you all, our distinguished and international partners. Good afternoon to our chairman and all the executive council members of After Policy Network Group. And also good afternoon to all our affiliate executives and all our distinguished members overseas and across the globe. This afternoon, we are gathered here as part of uh, implementation process of the African Connected Free Trade uh, uh, to see its success in every front and every dimension we have to look at. And so we cherish every participant and we cherish every speaker. Our focus today has to do with the rules of origin, which is very, very important and one of the bellies of the agreement. And we are very happy that uh, seasoned speakers have accepted our invitation to enlighten us. And it's going to be very interactive after this session. The first session is going to be uh, remarks by um, our, 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 our chosen speakers and partners. And then we open up for the two main speakers of the day to continue with their presentation. And then we'll come to question and answers. We are, we are transmitting live from YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. So you can still join through. First of all, I want to welcome, in welcoming this um, conference, I want to invite Her Excellency, the Moroccan Ambassador, who has been very, very supportive of this agenda, to give her her five minutes opening remarks for this conference. Thank you. Your Excellency, you're good to go. And thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts about Morocco's stance regarding the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, the dream of the founding fathers of the Organization of African Unity for a united and prosperous continent in a spirit of unity and solidarity is a step closer to reality today with the advent of the AFCFTA. The pandemic has uh, deepened the socioeconomic inequalities in our African countries. The uncertainty created confronts us with the need to fulfill the common vision of the AFCFTA, which consists of working on the basis of our complementarities to develop intra-African trade, to promote the employment of African labor, and to finally industrialize Africa. Morocco strongly believes in co-development based on intra-African cooperation and economic complementarity on active solidarity and the pooling of means and efforts. It must be said here that the Moroccan companies have benefited from the proactive vision of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, who has placed Sub-Saharan Africa as key strategic objective in partnerships. As a result, trade between Morocco and the African continent experienced an average annual growth of 6% over the period between 2009 and 2019. Experts have almost tripled during the last 10 years. It was 21 uh, billion in, tw in 2019 against 8.3 billion in 2009. Imports also rose to 17, almost 18 billion against 13 in 2009. While trade is on the rise, significant potential still remains to be developed. The African Development Bank ranks Morocco as the second biggest African investor in Sub-Saharan Africa and the first African investor in Western Africa with up to 85% of Moroccan FDI going to the region. Moroccan direct investments rose from 3 billion in 2009 to 6.8 billion in 2019 with an average annual growth rate of 8.3. Moroccan investments in Africa are now present in 29 countries in 2019, compared to only nine countries in 2009. The AFCFTA, once implemented, would undoubtedly benefit all of us African countries. For instance, Moroccan economic operators will be able to source raw materials at a lower cost, such as cocoa, which of which Ghana is the world's second largest producer. Today, Ghanaian cocoa is exported to Europe and then resold to African countries like Morocco, whereas it could be exported directly in a win-win partnership situation. On the other hand, every day, 
up to 120 trucks take the road from Agadir in Morocco to transport Moroccan uh, fruits and vegetables to West African countries, mainly Senegal and Guinea, where there is a strong demand for these very affordable products. The European Union being the main market for Moroccan fruits and vegetables, the same products end up in the Ghanaian markets re-exported directly from the EU countries at a much higher cost. Besides, both countries can, within the framework of the AFCFTA, develop a platform for the export and import of fisheries, agro-food products. They can also establish regular shipping lines between the ports of Morocco and the Ghanaian ports of Tema and Takoradi. It is our concern, concerted momentum, it is our common will that will establish the economic competitiveness essential to the emergence of Africa. Let us hence embrace the opportunities before us and strengthen our ties and ensure future prosperity for our people in Morocco, in Ghana and in Africa. I thank you for your attention and wish uh, all of us a very good interaction. Thank you. Um, guests of honor, who is the head of the programs of African Continental Free Trade Secretariat. He has been very instrumental and he's still instrumental. We want to welcome Dr. Mangeni to also continue with the opening remarks for this wonderful conference. Dr. Mangeni, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, everybody. I would like to begin by commending uh, the After Policy Network for this event. Highest commendations to you. And uh, I would like to convey our gratitude to you for including us uh, on this very important uh, program. Now, as we speak, the African continent of free trade area is in force. Trading has started in earnest. Okay. Right. So I was saying that trading started on the 1st of January 2021. And uh, as we speak now, uh, Ghana has already exported uh, some consignments uh, to South Africa and to Guinea. We have 36 ratifications, Zambia being the latest. We have got 54 signatures, just one country, the state of Eritrea, is remaining to sign. We have got 41 tariff offers, 34 services offers. So this provides a very good start to our trading. It's estimated that uh, the agreed rules of origin, which are at 82%, uh, cover actually 75% of intra-Africa trade. So we can have commercially meaningful trade on the African continental free trade area. This is a huge market. We are talking about the $3.4 trillion economy, which makes it the fifth largest in the whole, in the whole world. So we encourage investors, uh, traders, to really go to come to Africa as the place uh, to go. The huge market that we have will also catalyze investment into infrastructure as well, surface transport, air transport, energy, and ICT. Uh, we want production to take place because with a huge market, if you don't have anything to sell on it, it's not good at all for you. So we want production, production to be uh, scaled up. So this is where the rules of origin come in. Our rules of origin are designed to ensure that we trade made in Africa. We, we, the, the continent of free trade area is for us, for our products. So we want investors to come into Africa to have partnerships with the, us Africans, and then we produce for the African market. We want our rules of origin to promote industrialization. And this is done through ensuring local content in some, state, in some cases ranging from 40% or up to 70% in some cases, or wholly obtained if we have uh, the raw materials uh, that we require, available inadequate predictable quantities on the continent. And then through value chains, we want nobody to be left behind. Women, young Africans, SMEs must equally benefit from the African continent of free trade area. And one way of doing this, of ensuring this, is through regional value chains, so that everybody is tapping into the production processes, into the linkages that we have throughout Africa. So with these few remarks, I would like to wish you uh, fruitful deliberations and then to thank you once again uh, for inviting us and to commend you highly on putting on this very important event. 
Back to you, Louis. Chief partner, uh, the managing director of Bank of Africa. Uh, he's been very instrumental in this whole uh, process to give us his remarks for this conference. And Mr. Uh, Kobe, you're welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. And um, I, I must say, I'm very happy that Bank of Africa is part of this uh, webinar, uh, collaborating with the African Policy Network. Um, it's almost natural that we, uh, as a member of the BMC BOA uh, uh, Bank of Africa group, I'm glad uh, my ambassador is here. We are Moroccan bank. We are uh, about the 12th largest bank in uh, Africa. Um, we have uh, assets of about 30 billion revenue, about $20 billion. Uh, we are in um, about 700 branches in Morocco. We have uh, almost 600 branches in Africa, throughout Africa, uh, Spain, uh, France, um, the UK, China, uh, Italy, Germany, UAE, uh, Brussels, uh, Canada, and Netherlands. So, of course, naturally, we see ourselves as the trade bank of Africa. And um, being part of uh, this is an essential uh, core uh, business uh, for us. Um, uh, we, we see the uh, African continental Af uh, free trade agreement as a very critical component of developing trade in um, Africa. Uh, the aim of removing about 90% of tariffs, um, um, boosting trade by 52%, and aiming to be the largest free trade area in the world uh, since the WTO was established is critical and, and, and ambition that we want to be part of. So I can assure uh, Louis and his team that we, that we hope this will not be the last of this collaboration. Uh, we, we would be part of this journey and support uh, this uh, noble endeavor. And uh, I hope uh, in your trade businesses, you remember that we are a key partner for trade in Africa. Thank you. Mr. Uh, El Safti. So El Safti is the managing director of General Motors North Africa. He's in charge of manufacturing and quality assurance. Mr. El Safti, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Mr. Louis. Um, my pleasure to be with you all uh, here uh, today in this uh, valuable event. And from industrial uh, sector, we are looking for uh, building a strong industry uh, in Africa uh, with several export hub in North of Africa, West and South. And this will help us to promote what we call the made in Africa. We have a strong industry base in North of Africa and Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia. And we have also another base for South Africa where we have a strong industry. And other countries have a strong and diversified uh, raw uh, material. So we can use all this together to build strong, sustainable manufacturing in Africa and reduce a lot of cost. I think also we need to keep working together to improve the infrastructure because infrastructure is one of key competitiveness that will help us to keep utilizing uh, this free uh, trade agreement. As you mentioned, this free trade agreement will be very good to or as a foundation for improving the industrial sector through reducing all bureaucracy and all the kind of customs between African uh, countries. Thank you, Mr. Louis. I need to thank you all and thank all your special guests today. And pleasure to be with you all. Uh, Mr. Salish Navasaria. Mr. Salish is the group director for Africa of one of the largest uh, equity fund managers close almost about 80 billion dollars from JTC Group. So you are welcome for having time with us. The floor is yours. Uh, uh, good afternoon to you all and uh, from our small island in the Channel Islands called Jersey. So uh, I thank you, my thanks to uh, you, Lewis, and uh, to the Secretariat for having me on your distinguished uh, panel of discussion. Um, uh, just to give you a bit of brief introduction, uh, JTC is a sort of a global professional services provider with a deep expertise in funds, uh, corporate and private client services. Uh, we're a FTSE 250 company quoted on the London Stock Exchange, and we have been covering um, this region for in excess of 30 years, uh, also having a physical presence in 
uh, with offices in South Africa and, and also in Mauritius. Um, around one in five of our international team, including myself, are born in Africa. And we have a real passion and commitment for the region. Um, we perhaps view this discussion uh, with a different lens through a wider engagement, um, given that we look after and administer many structures for a diverse range of uh, stakeholders, investors, um, finance uh, coming into Africa for fund, from fund managers, uh, from development finance institutions, private equity, social impact investors, uh, family offices, and of course the wider diaspora that invest into the region. Um, I mean, one of the telling statistics sometimes that stood out when I was reading through the various reports in preparation uh, just to you know, participate, uh, are the simple statistics on the inter-regional trades. And in Europe, that yeah. account, the inter-European trade accounts for 67%, in Asia, 61%, in the Americas, 47%, and in Africa, it's only 15%. So I think there's a lot of scope to, um, uh, to grow and to compete out there um, and, and, to, and to really show Africa's clout. Uh, within the region. I mean, in a sense, we are all children of different colonial legacies. And yet, if we, if you look at the sheer volume and the number of uh, regional blocks that exist um, within Africa itself, then we've only got ourselves to be to blame for being divided. Um, now, if, if you look at the sheer number of, uh, from an overseas investors perspective, it's very confusing to view Africa at times. I mean, you look at things like, I mean, the sheer number of uh, regional trade blocks, for example. You know, you've got the Pomesa, you've got SADAC, you've got East African Community, you've got... You know, how many of us can really figure out who's who and, and uh, without going into a Google search? So I think, I think there's a lot more scope. And I think we, from our side, wholeheartedly applaud uh, and indeed support the Africa Union's uh, initiative with the free trade area. And by creating a uh, cohesive economic uh, block to speed up social and economic welfare, as well as the health and wealth of this great and vibrant continent. And a humble thank you um, and best wishes for an integrated, prosperous and peaceful Africa. Everybody really want to know what's going on whether it's ready, how are we going to trade, what qualifies for as what, who has the right to let its product enter whose country, what is exempted. People are asking questions. At this time, I want to present to you two of our finest people who has worked closely with this after rules of origin. And I want to start with uh, Onami, who has been on, on a special uh, uh, contract, doing a lot of consultancy for the African Union and she has been part of this special process. And then when she's done with her presentation, we'll also take the next speaker and then we ask questions. So Madam Onami, thank you for your time. We are grateful and want you to share your expertise. Thank you very much. Afternoon and thank you for unmuting me. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all over Africa and the world as per your time zone. Uh, like I've already been introduced, my name is Onami Klole. I'm a rules of origin expert and uh, AFCFTA is very close to my heart. I've participated uh, during the negotiation and also supported uh, the African Union uh, at the Secretariat. So with that said, uh, uh, Program Director, I will kindly uh, switch off my video and start to share my screen and the presentation, if that you find that in order. Yes, please carry on. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. Can you allow me to share the screen, please? Allowed you. Please go ahead. I've allowed you. Please go ahead. Uh, it's still popping up the same message. Can you retry it again? Oh, really? 
Okay. Yes, can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Yes, please. Uh, I can't see it from my side. I can't see it from my side. You still can't see it. Okay, um, excuse me. Yes, can you? Please, yes, I please have. Again? Yes, okay. I have allowed you. Okay, just a minute. Let's try it again. All right, it's okay. Then we can continue. Is that fine? Okay, yes. Can you see it? Yes, we can see. Yes, like we have already been introduced that we'll be speaking on the rules of origin. Rules of origin, uh, normally, uh, if I may say, we tend to be a bit slow in uh, introducing them or training the traders and the business people uh, into this, uh, knowing how they're supposed to qualify in trade agreements. I'm so excited uh, to uh, have been given this opportunity by the APN to come and speak to the rules of origin because it's really, really important for the business people, for the industries, for also the officials who are administering the rules of origin to understand and know how goods get to qualify to be uh, known as the AFCFTA products. As you all see on your screen, it's written rules of origin, import, export, in the middle, we see who is in the middle is the AFCFTA, the African Dream. Quickly, I'll take you through our session content for today. We will go through the AFCFTA overview and go through the AFCFTA rules of origin objectives, the implementation of the AFCFTA rules of origin, potential opportunities for traders and businesses then the recommendation from me. We carry on. We start with the overview. The African Continental Free Trade Area is a flagship program uh, for the, just a minute. It's a flagship pro problem for the African Union, the Agenda 2063. It's a blueprint uh, for the, it's a blueprint for attaining the, Hold on a bit, my computer is giving me trouble here. Yes, it's a blueprint for attaining inclusive and sustainable development across the continent for the next 50 years. You can just imagine the African dream that we have uh, with this African continental free trade being part of that dream, the Agenda 2063. What is the main objective of the AFCFTA? The main objective of the AFCFTA is to create a single continent market for goods and services with free movement of business persons and investments and thus paving a way for accelerating the establishment of a customs union. What a beautiful future for Africa. Let me quickly run through the milestones of the AFCFTA. In March 2018, the AU summit adopted the agreement establishing the AFCFTA together with its protocols, the protocol in trading goods, trading services, and the dispute settlements. Then in the same year in July 2018, the AU summit adopted the annexes to the above mentioned protocols. Amongst them was the rules of origin annex. Annex 2. July 2019, the AU summit launched the operational phase of the AFCFTA, supported by the agreed rules of origin, the dashboard of the AU Trade Observatory, the continental mechanism of monitoring and reporting and elimination of non tariff barriers, the Pan African payment and settlement system. What beautiful! Uh, what beautiful instruments that were, were being launched there. We all know that after July 2019, we are all faced with a pandemic at the beginning to, of, of, of 2020, January around March, it got worse and things slowed down. 
But let me tell you this, Africa remained resilient about their dream to see in the IFCFTA trading. They continued to work on the background, though the things were slowing down, but they continued to work after July 2019 because the first trade date was first of Ju, Ju, of was first of Ju, of July of was first of July 2020. But it didn't happen because of the pandemic. Then in August 2020, we see another beautiful milestone. I actually participated and viewed that uh, ceremony and a tear dropped uh, in my face. As I saw the government of the Republic of Ghana in Accra handing over the business center of the AFCFTA to the AUC chairperson, to me it was say, indeed, the African dream is becoming true. Then the other hugest milestone that I've experienced is in January 2021, this year, after the African continent toiled and worked day and night, our chief negotiators, our trade ministry, our head of state, working very hard to see this dream coming true. January 2021, the first, we saw the AFCFTA starting to trade. Now in front of you here, we'll look at the architecture or the structure of how the AFCFTA agreement is, is, is presented. The AFCFTA trade agreement was negotiated in three phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. In phase one, the protocol on trading goods, you remember we talked about the, the milestones that side, that was in phase one. The protocol in trading goods, the protocol in trade in services and protocol in dispute settlements were presented to the AU summit and they were adopted, as I have mentioned in the first uh, slide. So underneath this uh, protocols, protocol on trade in goods and protocol on trade in services, you remember that I said in, 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 in the same year, there were the, the annexes were also adopted. So underneath this protocol on trade in goods, they adopted the annex also on rules of origin, which is the main reason why we are here. On phase two, they'll continue to negotiate the competition policy, the protocol on intellectual property, the protocol on investment. And then in phase three, which was supposed to be phase three, that, that has been moved to phase two, to also to negotiate the protocol on e-commerce. We all know the reason why it will have to be fast-tracked because of the situation we find ourselves and the dynamics that are happening in trade. We are all here gathered uh, uh, in front of our, our screens, gadgets, because of technology. So we will, we will also, as Africa, have to speed up and ensure that we work on the protocol on e-commerce so that we'll be able to partake from what is happening around the world. Now, the AFCFT rules, where do we find them? Where are they? We always hear AFCFTA rules. The AFCFTA rules are found on the protocol on trading goods, Annex 2 on rules of origin, and the Appendix 4 to Annex 2 on rules of origin. In front of you, I've tried to screenshot the documents on Annex 2. That's the first one that you see. The second one, that's the Appendix 4 on, on Annex 2 on rules of origin, where you see the chapter where the, 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 your products are found, the, the co column two, where you find the description of your, your product and column three, where you find the conditions that you have to fulfill. What are the objectives of the AFCFG rules of origin? As I listened to Dr. Mangena, he said that, Dr. Mangena said that uh, the rules are designed in such a way that they will allow Africa to grow. They will allow us to trade in ourselves and work, industrialize our economy. That's exactly what the objective of the AFTFT when they were drafted were to attain. They were to attain to deepen integration at regional and continental level, to boost intra-African trade, to promote regional uh, value chains and also to foster transformation uh, through industrialization. You can see how uh, 
as serious Africa is with this trade agreement. Now, we heard about the rules of origin. We had where the AFCFTA rules of it, we had where we can find them. But what are these rules of origin? What is rules of origin? Wait a minute. Rules of origins are rules and regulations that determine the economic nationality of a product. Let's come to the same page. Remember that as, as, as individuals, as I speak from here, I have the nationality that I'm identified with. Same goes to the goods. They also have their economic nationality. The gadget that you are watching uh, these proceedings from has its economic nationality made from somewhere. We are all here for made, from Af made in Africa. The conditions of, for, for products to attain the AFCFTA economic nationality are specified, remember, in Annex 2 of the Protocol on Trade in Goods and it's Appendix 4. Those pictures are just to show you that goods also have passports, they have visas, they have the way they are treated. Whether in a trade agreement or not, when they enter the borders, believe me as I speak as a customs officer as well, we treat goods differently depending on where they are coming from. So same with the AFCFTA products, they will be accorded a different treatment as per the agreement. Then, Anami, how do we qualify? How do I qualify in AFCFTA? For the goods to attain the AFCFTA origin qualification, one of the two main criteria should be fulfilled, the AFCFTA criteria. They look similar around the world, but they are crafted differently as you go down to all the trade agreements. One, they have to be wholly obtained goods, which means the goods have to be naturally occurring in that country or in the AFCFTA. Two, we all know that we cannot have everything. Like people always say that no man is an island, same goes to continents. There are other raw materials that we we'll need to include for us to manufacture or to industrialize. So what did the negotiator think about? They said, okay, then the goods will have to be sufficiently worked or processed so that we build up those industries. So you have to sufficiently work on the products so that it qualifies under the AFCFTA. What is sufficiently worked? You have to add some value. The amount of non-originating materials, which means materials that are not originating in the AFCFTA, should be to a certain level, as described on the Appendix 4. He should at least, at least change the tariff classification or the specific processes, the chemical reactions, the way you are assembling things, the manufacture from natural fibers, from yarn, those are the processes they're talking about. Still on how to qualify, you said wholly obtained. What is wholly obtained? I'm a teacher again by profession. I wish it was a class so that I can point at people to answer the questions. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, what is wholly obtained? Wholly obtained is as outlined in Article 5 of Annex 2 on rules of origin. Like we have already said, they are naturally occurring. There's a list in that Article 5. You find that there should be a minerals, products, or other non-living natural resources that are extracted, plants, including aquatic plants, Life animals, listen to this. Life animals, they should be born and raised within that country. 
they will not grant you the preferential treatment, the AFCFTA uh, gold glove treatment when you enter the border if the animal was not born and raised. If you go buy an animal in Brazil, in Australia, and raise it as a calf to a cattle, and then now you say to a cow, then now you say it's originating. No, the rules in AFCFTA are say the animal should be born and raised within the AFCFTA. The products obtained from the live animals, yes, you can go and get a chicks from other country. You can go and get the calf, the dairy calf, and then milk it. The only the milk is the one that is going to originate, but not the cow. That's what the rules of origin are saying. They are avoiding a situation where now we will now be raised, we will now be getting animals from other continents and move them around the continent and deem them to be African. Let's continue. Still on how to qualify and wholly obtained. I just posed a question here. A farmer in Ghana imports one week old chickens from Brazil. Like I said, I'm a teacher. I wish it was a class. Are the eggs laid in Ghana by those chickens considered to be originating in Ghana under the AFCFTA? The answer is yes. The eggs are originating in Ghana as per Article 5, Paragraph 1D. You remember that we said the products obtained from life animals found therein. Yes, we continue. Now we talk to how, how to qualify. That part where we say you can now go get some little bit from other continents and, and, and combine manufacture. Yes, the sufficient process. The example of change in tariff classification. The AFCF chair product, the rule is saying, as you see it down there, projected down there in chapter 46, manufacturers of straw and those baskets, that's the description. You remember the, the screenshot of the appendix four? Yes. And then the rule, the condition that you should manufacture from materials of any heading other than that of the product provided, the materials of chapter 14 are wholly obtained. Now they are saying anything from chapter 14, the straws, the wood, the grass, the wood, you should get it from Africa. If you're going to be using maybe wire or something to do the, the, the basket, then you can get it from somewhere. But it should be sufficiently wet. We continue. Now we talk about the value of non-originating material. How much value have you added? Now we take an example. I picked one of the, the rules of origin, the, the, the headings, the subheadings from the appendix four, uh, 84, 81, 90. Now it's saying imported, the valve casting of 84, 81, 90 is imported into Nigeria for further work and exported to South Africa. It's imported from another continent there, whether it's coming from the UK or Europe, then it's imported into Nigeria to prepare the, the manufacturing process. Remember, the working should be sufficient. I keep on repeating it. You don't just assemble and, and then you send it out. You work. Why are we doing that? We want to industrialize Africa. We want to create employment in Africa. So we cannot come and assemble and be an assembling continent. We are going to work on it to build our Africa. And now the answer is saying the percentage value of this uh, product is 55%. The rule on itself, though is not reflected here, if you go to it on Appendix 4, is saying that the manufacturer should be not more than 60%. So this one is less than uh, 60%. It means that the 40% local content has been attained. So yes, we can now say the good is from Nigeria, then as South Africa, 
customs officials can now put on their AFCFTA golden gloves and accept and receive the valve casting from Nigeria with lots of love. And then, so the rule has been fulfilled. Now, you kept on hearing me saying that they should be sufficiently wet, they should be sufficiently wet, and you've been asking yourself, how will I know whether they are sufficiently wet or not? There is an article in the agreement that speaks to the processes that are conferring are not conferring origin. One, these are some of them, they, the whole list there. Breaking up or assembling of packages, you cannot just come and assembly simple, simple assembly that UNAMI can also do at home and put up a stand and now start saying, I have a factory. Now it can trade under AFCFTA. It can trade under the normal rules where you will pay duties but you cannot trade under the AFCFTA because the rules of origin do not allow you. Washing and cleaning, removing dust, and then you just send it off, is not allowed according to the AFCFTA. Simple painting, slaughtering an animal. You remember I said you don't just go get the animal and then bring it here and then start selling it in Africa and say that it's made in Africa. No, the rules do not allow that. So the animal has to be what? Born and raised within the continent. Now, the implementation of AFCFJ rules, I'll just touch base with a little background because I know Mr. Fishin Akota is here to deal with all the procedures of the implementation. So I'll just touch here and there. He will expand on this ones. What do business need to know now? And I may have qualified, I am wholly obtained. Now here are my products I've manufactured. What do I do? Business have to know the origin criteria. That one we have dealt with it. And the trade liberalization. You have to know the tariff concessions that have been given. How do you know them? You will find them in the country of import where you are sending your goods. I've seen the South African uh, schedule for AFCFTA online on Google. So you just go there and look at the AFCFTA, Google it, it'll come out. So that you know what you need to pay and what you need to, not to pay under the AFCFTA. You have to know the types of proofs of origin, the passport you remember, and the visa for the good. What do you need to show at the border as a proof? that the goods are originating. You have to know the country's designated competent authority. Where do you get the proof? Where do you submit your registrations for this agreement? You have to know the registration procedures, procedures for issuance of the proof of origin. Businesses, that's what you have to know. I repeat, we tend to be a little bit slow on rules of origin, but they are the license to trade in a trade agreement. There is no trade agreement without conditions for trading. We'll go through the proof of origin. Like I said, Mr. Cotter will go through them. I'll just run through them. We have the certificate of origin in the AFCFTA, which is issued by the competent authority. We have the origin declaration, which is some form of self-certification endorsed on the commercial documents, but there is a threshold for that. It's not for everybody. There is a threshold that needs to be attained for you to use it. As per the provision that I've read from the AFCFTA agreement. We have the supplier's declaration. We are not the, proceed we are not the producer but you want to trade under the AFCFTA. Your supplier can always give you the supplier's declaration. We can also use it for full accumulation. Those are other topics that are within the rules of origins that we cannot speak about now or else we'll take the whole day. Remember all this, either one that you're going to use, they need to be accompanied by 
the usual customs documentation. The supplier declaration gives you license to, the, to be issued the certificate of origin. You don't send it to, 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 to benefit through it. It gives you license that the producer is, has qualified, then you can be issued your certificate of origin. We'll talk about it next time. Uh, I do believe that is, this is not the last time we will keep on uh, working on rules of origin. Now, what are the opportunities? What are the benefits? Why should I, why should I, why should I be working hard and trying to qualify under the AFCFTA? What are the benefits of this agreement? The benefits of this agreement, job creation for women and youth. As you all know, women are working hard there. Like I've already touched on the origin declaration, this agreement is also so special in that way that it brought in the origin declaration so that our women that are involved in small, small businesses, they can also be able to prove their origin. The other thing is the opportunity for micro, small and medium enterprises to enter the regional value chain. It's an opportunity. Investors are coming to set up, the value chains are setting up, so you can also pitch in and get something from there. The preferential market access, in the preferential market access of the AFCFTA, there are no quotas, the duties are waived, the competitive prices, because you are entering the market at a preferential, you remember those golden gloves and the love that you've given as you enter because you are AFCFTA, you have to be treated the way the agreement has said, then you have the preferential market access. So that's why you have to, to go through proving that the goods are African. The reduced cost of doing business through the self-certification that has been introduced for micro and small medium business enterprises. If your export is less than $5,000 US dollars and you are an approved exporters, approved exporters, they are exporters that have been vetted by the customs or the designated authority in that country and proved that their goods are originating and they are very compliant, then they are given a go ahead to write a self-certification on the commercial document or the invoice. You remember we talked about the reduced customs duty, the preferential treatment. Look at this. Example of a tariff schedule is not for any, any country. It's just an example for you to see what you will benefit. Why should you go through all this trouble to qualify and to get that AFCFTA originating status? You see that when you enter the market of that country without any agreement, you are paying 40%. Let's take, for example, let's say SADC. I don't, I, 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 I don't mean that SADC is, is charging 40%. It's just an example. Then you, you, you move to other, other agreement. You find out that the, the valves castings are still, when you enter the SADC market, you pay 40%. And then now come to the AFCFTA, the all-time agreement, the African dream. What a beautiful future. Then you have the AFCFTA now say, okay, if you bring the AFCFTA proof of origin, now we charge you 20.5 duty or maybe free duty. What does it mean? You are going to be competitive, same product, same qualification of, of standards in the market, but you enter the Ghanaian or the Nigerian market at 20% instead of 40. Who is better placed between you and the person who's entering at a general rate? It's you. Now you can beat the market thanks to the AFCFTA. Recommendations from my side, my opinions rather, Get enough information about the AFCFTA for you to benefit. They say information is power. I say information is life. How do you live without information? So get as much as you can information about the AFCFTA, then you are good to go. 
do an AFCFTA market research. This one goes to the investors around the world. Look at the market, what is in there? Remember, Africa is endowed with very, very beautiful uh, raw material resources. Whatever you call for, you find it in Africa. Diamonds, you find them here. Everything, timber, you find it here. Cocoa, your coffee, you find it here. Understand the conditions of the AFCFTA rules. Like I said, I keep on repeating it. Rules of origin are the engine of the trade agreement. How do I give you the preferential treatment when I don't know you? When you enter the borders, you produce your passport, they know that you are Ghanaian, you are Botswana, you are Kenya, whether you need a visa or you don't need a visa. Same goes to the goods. Customs use rules of origin, the origin of the goods to discriminate them, but in a positive way to know which one is supposed to be treated how. We treat goods differently as they enter in the customs shows. Identify and participate in the imaging value chains. Lastly, scale up the production and optimize on AFCFTA benefits. I know someone somewhere say, no, it's difficult to do it in Africa. Nobody said it's going to be easy. We all have to start somewhere. The European Union started somewhere to get to where they are. Therefore, Africa continue pushing on the dream. With that said, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kutu uh, is in charge of tariffs and, and, and uh, uh, tariffs uh, after tariffs in Ghana here with the GRA. He has been very, very instrumental and he's still very, very instrumental here. He, uh, he barely have time. But Mr. Kutu, you take on from here and take us to the practicality. If people do ask questions. Why is it that it's free? I go to the customs and I'm paying people still don't get the differences. So let's welcome Mr. Kutu. Take off from where uh, Unabi left uh, on the procedures for, for implementation. Uh, first of all, I would like to touch on the uh, uh, tariff um, concessions and dismantling scudders. Even though this is not uh, within the remit of customs, but there are things that concerns us and uh, which we need to understand. That's why probably the chairman is uh, mentioning issues that he's talking about. So at the start, unfortunately, I can't sh uh, share my screen because uh, I'm talking from uh, points just that you just noted. And my presentation almost fell in line with what uh, uh, Unami presented. But let me talk on the uh, tariff concessions and the uh, dismantling scudders as a continuation to what she has presented. And uh, let me inform participants that the, uh, the following customs unions and the uh, uh, state parties or member states have made the following, the following offers to the AU. And uh, first of all, we have the CIMAC group. They have made a total tariff uh, offer of 90%. And when you analyze the rules that have been uh, what agreed on, and the rules of origin that uh, Unami spoke about, it makes about 95.9%. It means you should be able to trade with up to 95.9% of what they have offered. Tariff lines. Then the ESC has also submitted offers up to 79.3%. And from the analysis on the rules that have been agreed on on the Appendix 4 that is in discussion, they should be able to trade up to 68.4%. And then the ECOWAS has made a submission up to 90% of their tariff lines. And on analysis, we cannot trade up to about 72.7% with others. 
the circle has submitted 75.9% of their tariff lines. And uh, when you analyze, they should be able to trade up to 75.9% of uh, the appendix fund that has been agreed on. Then we have DR Congo as a state party. They have also offered 90%. And uh, they can trade up to 71.1% of the rules that have been agreed on. Egypt has also made offers, but the analysis has not been completed yet, so I cannot give you figures on that. Madagascar has issued, offered 90.8%, which boils down to 74.5% that they can trade on in the agreed rules. Malawi has 90.8%, and uh, they can trade up to 73.7%. We have Mauritius, they have also offered 90.8%, and you can trade up to 70.7%. Sao Tome and Principal has uh, offered 76.4%. But analysis on, their, uh, on the rules that have been agreed on has not been done yet. Seychelles has offered 96.2%. And then when you analyze, they can trade up to 78.5%. And lastly, Zambia has over 91.5%. And uh, when you analyze the country up to 79.5%. And what does all this mean to us? It means that when you put all this that I have uh, 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 mentioned, you get up to 41%. Uh, state parties or member states that have submitted. It means that you are breaking down those who have uh, submitted as a uh, customs union and those who have uh, submitted as individual countries. So when you take account of them, you get up to 41. What does it mean to us? It means that these countries are now open up for what we call either bilateral or multilateral negotiations for us to agree on how much we can trade between or amongst ourselves. When that agreement has been reached, then we can now go ahead successfully and start trading with these countries. And let's uh, note that these offers have come along with what we call dismantling calendars. The offers uh, has come with dismantling calendars. And what does it mean? It tells us how they are going to knock off the tariffs from their HS on the commodities that have been traded the 90% that have been offered for trading. It tells us how they are going to knock off. Let's remember that the agree, uh, uh, agreement aligned or the negotiation agreed that we will knock off of our tariff lines progressively for 10 years. It means that it will take us up to 10 years to be able to knock off the tariffs is after 10 years that we'll get the tariffs up to 0%. If you, let me uh, zoom down to the ECOWAS office. ECOWAS has decided to dismantle progressively on all the tariff bans for the 10 years. If you look at the ECOWAS common external tariff, we have five tariff bands, 0%, 5%, 10%, 20% uh, and 35%. It means that for every year, for each tariff band, you use the tariff rate divided by the total number of years to know the number of, or uh, the uh, fraction that will be knocked off. Which means that for this year, 
for zero percent obviously remains zero any commodity attracting five percent will now attract four point five percent and any commodity attracting ten percent will attract nine percent anything attracting twenty percent will attract eighteen percent and for thirty five percent commodities you uh, pay thirty one point five percent this is what ECOWAS has offered. And when you go through all the offers of the other countries, you see the kind of dismantling calendar that they have presented. So the distinguished delegates, there is need for us, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Obin, for us to understand the dismantling calendars for the various countries, uh, state parties and customs union that have submitted their uh, 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 offers. And not just that, it is up to our countries to go into either bilateral or multilateral negotiations to agree between these two parties as to how we are going to, uh, uh, how much we are going to offer. So with this in mind, we now know the tariff offense. We know the rules operating. And what do we have to know, uh, do when we want to benefit or take advantage of this after to benefit of the tariff uh, 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 concessions and then the quota free? My sister Unami has presented us a set of rules. And these are the trading rules that will guide our operations. It implies that for every uh, 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 the product specific rule, that's the appendix four, we are using the customs tariff, the HS code. Then we have a rule for each chapter, for each heading, and in certain uh, exclusive situation, we have rule for the subheadings. There is need for us to understand and know these rules. And also there is need for us to know for each country the commodities that they have offered to liberalize. It is only the liberalized commodities that we can, can benefit from this tariff release or concessions. For ECOWAS, our total tariff uh, line is 6,129 6, tariff lines. So 90% of that will give us 5,516 uh, 5, tariff lines. So it means ECOWAS, this is what we are putting up. This is what we are giving. So if anybody wants to uh, uh, import, from ECOWAS country, you have to look and see whether your commodities fall within the 5,516 tariff line that ECOWAS has offered. And let me mention that the negotiations were done up to the sixth digit heading level. You know, we in ECOWAS, we have up to 10 digit codes, but the negotiations were done up to the six digit heading level, which is universal to all over the world. It means that we shouldn't have any issues of this country saying, I have my 10 digit code, I have 20 digit code, I have 8 digit code. No, the six digit is uh, uh, what? Applicable to all and all, everyone. So for you to be able to uh, 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 export to a state party with all the necessary conditions uh, 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 met, there is need for you to have the necessary after documentation. And uh, uh, Onami mentioned them. The first and foremost is that you should have an after certificate of origin and after certificate of origin 
discussions have been held to agree on the form of that certificate of origin. I think the Secretariat is uh, in the process of developing a prototype certificate that will be circulated, that should be same or uniform for all. And I'm sure within uh, the shortest possible time, these prototype certificates samples will be sent out to all the countries and we will have to produce our certificates of origin in line with what the Secretariat has developed. The features and other security features, the fields and the security features have been discussed and agreed on and adopted by summit. And also there is need for all the countries to make notification to the actor secretary of who their designated competent authorities are. In Ghana, the government has decided that customs division of GRA is the designated cost, uh, competent authority. It means that we are going to uh, issue the necessary certificates of origin. So also all countries will have to notify the after secretariat or who their designated competent authorities are or is in their country. And also secondly, not just notify on the designated competent authority, we have to notify on the authorized uh, uh, officials, their names, signatures, and stamps of the designated competent authority and also customs exit points or any country, the agency that is responsible for exports. Officials will have to sign and stamp these certificates of origin at the points of exit. These are all provisions on the certificate of origin. And we need to see all these things on the certificates before they can be accepted as to benefit from the reliefs. And I stress on this, on the certificate of origin, it should have been filled properly. It should be stamped and signed. The, the exporter will have to stamp and sign. The designated competent authority will have to stamp and sign. And so also should we see the stamp and signature of customs at the point of exit or the uh, agency that is responsible for exports in any state party. If you don't have this properly done, your consignments may not be accepted for uh, uh, tariff reliefs. And also the stamps and signatures, countries are supposed to notify. And let me say that a number of countries have uh, uh, notified on their uh, uh, authority, the signatures and stamps of uh, officials that are responsible. We in Ghana are in the process of notifying as well. And uh, I stress on this because it's very, very, very important. And you all understand why it is important that we verify these uh, signatures and stamps so that we eliminate uh, fraud in the system. And also, before an exporter can benefit from this uh, 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 or can even get a certificate of origin, you have to register as an exporter and after. You have to be registered. And a registration a reference number will be generated for you as a registered exporter and after. And uh, the requirement, one of the requirements is even that you have to be written to officially that you have registered 
and your reference number given to you. So if you want to be an exporter, and uh, after you have to register officially. And uh, after registering, then you can apply for a certificate of origin. And like Yonami mentioned, certain uh, uh, exporters will be registered as approved uh, exporters. And it comes with privileges. Just like probably if you are uh, conversant with what we call economic authorized economic operator schemes, which some countries are operating, it means that you will have to uh, 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 benefit from such uh, 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 privileges. So then you can use uh, your origin declaration instead of applying for certificate of origin. You enjoy such a privilege. And also the focus of the after is on women, youth, SMEs. So they can also take advantage and use what we call the origin declaration instead of going for what? Certificate of origin. And the, the rules, as we have agreed on, are very flexible, easy to apply. We uh, should be very conversant with them. We should be conversant with the procedures that the various countries are putting in place. We Ghana, in Ghana are developing a very comprehensive procedure that we are going to publish to all our economic operators that will guide them in their activities. And let me also mention that the Secretariat is in the process of finalizing the operational manual. The, we have an operational manual to guide uh, 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 economic operators how the, uh, 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 the rules of origin will uh, what, operate. The manual will give you guidance as to how you go about it. I, uh, uh, I'm sure that in the few, next few months, the operational manual will be completed and it will be available to our economic operators. And this will give you good guidance uh, in your operations. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm sure I've uh, almost exhausted my time. Let me leave it here. When there are questions to address, I'll come and address them accordingly. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to quickly move to uh, question and answers. And uh, let me know if you want to ask a question now. And let me know the speaker you are referring your questions to. You can raise your hand and then we will, we will have you. So we open it for question and answers. Please raise your hand so that uh, Joyce, can you help me in identifying those whose hands are raised up? Sure. And those who are watching on live too, you can post your questions on Facebook, um, the comment session or the YouTube comment session, and we'll read those questions as well. Yeah, so the floor is open for questions. Um, uh, it's open, Mr. Koto or to Onami. The questions are, let them flow. And uh, Mr. Benza, can you help us in the, in, the, in the chat, those who are sending their questions so that we can ask on their behalf? Um, uh, my question is related to do with the rules of origin. How far are we in terms of preparedness? And from the threat forwarding sector, are the rules of origin ready? Because we cannot move goods without the rules of origin. They're very important. Uh, we want something to show to customs authorities. So I wanted to find out our state of preparedness. Statistics I gave in the beginning of the, uh, my presentation tells us that we are ready. Uh, the offers that uh, have been made, uh, and then the analysis made on the offer based on their 90% uh, tariff line shows that almost uh, the agreed rules of origin are over 70% which is good enough for us to train on. 
you know, uh, these uh, agreements, uh, rules of origin take a lot of time to uh, uh, be concluded. So what we have is good enough for trading to commence. Uh, that's my response to the question. Thank you very much. My name is Kwaida from South Africa. Um, rules of um, the, the two presenters, um, I didn't hear anything that speak to um, a method of dispute segment under the, 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 the AFC FTA. Because um, we know that uh, we are economies at, at various le at varying levels of development, so and um, so there there is room because the the the, the stem from a, an authority customs authority is not usually. Um, ensuring that not necessarily ensure that uh, uh, foul play cannot come to be. So um, we need to really ensure that this process works smoothly and it advances the, 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 the development of this continent. So for me, what, what, I, what are the what is the mechanism that has been put in terms of dispute segment? And then not to the two speakers, but to the, to the IP, the Africa Policy Forum, that we need to, um, we need to look at a way of going down, that is to ensure the process does not leave anyone out the integration process, the continental integration process does not leave anyone out. We go down and ensure um, the qualification of standards, uniformity of that, and also ensure that that micro, small, medium enterprise is able to take advantage of this opportunity and trade the standards the, 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 not only the qualification standard, but also the product standards that Africa sells um, a good that can be consumed in any and every part of this continent. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, your questions have been heard. Uh, there are a few questions inside. I don't know, maybe let me read quickly so that we can answer all together. Uh, a question from Someone is asking, is, are the certificates of origin manual or electronic? And then also uh, from Dr. Sindhu. Dr. Sindhu, maybe you can ask the question directly if, if we can unmute you. Hello, Dr. Sindhu. Sindhu, you can ask your question, please. Yeah, hello everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, for mentioning me also. Uh, what uh, I am trying to understand that, okay, theory of uh, like you are settling the um, origin issue and uh, origin certificates will be there and that will be the native export and uh, native trade and uh, that will be uh, the contributory factor. But uh, now with all this digital integration, wherein you are integrating with certain uh, uh, other uh, digital products which are outside Ghana. So how will you interact with that? Because uh, there it is, there is no origin system like any app which is in, uh, interacting with uh, say payment gateways. And that like your export is okay, origin is there, but uh, the payment gateway is based in other country. So uh, like, this origin will stop uh, that uh, transaction. Uh, does it mean that or it will be free that, okay, there is going to be interaction and integration of other entities also, which can um, um, provide the basis for the origin. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, our speakers, can you answer the questions? Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, 
I know uh, Mr. Kutu has already answered the one that says uh, preparedness is the rules, are the rules of origin ready? Uh, I, 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 I would want also to refer to the, uh, the opening remarks by Mr. Mangeni. He said that uh, 71 rules of origin are at 71, uh, I mean the trades, the agreed rules of origin are at a 71 possibility to trade within Africa. I think that enough for us to continue with the trading while we work on the remaining rules of origin. And uh, the, the other part of the preparedness, uh, we should all also remember in my presentation, I, 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 I referred to you uh, having information on the designated or, or authority in your country. Preparedness is also at the country of export where you'll be exporting uh, your, your goods, whether they are ready with their certificate, whether they have procured all the certificates, uh, 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 ju or just like that. So uh, preparedness is also at a national level. Is the country ready to start issuing out the uh, certificate? That's the information is life I was talking about. Consult the, the, the competent authority in your country of export. They will definitely uh, issue you with your certificate of origin. On the other one, I think as is Miss Chawita. I'm sorry, I didn't get the name properly. Uh, where you stated uh, about is there any dispute mechanism or dispute settlement procedures? Uh, as I, I I presented in the in my presentation in that architecture, remember that picture where I talked about the protocol on dispute settlement. Uh, that one is a different topic uh, for, for, for the next time, I think, because it's all to do with the lawyers. So there is a dispute settlement uh, provision or protocol in the AFCFTA. So I want to believe that APN will bring in the lawyers to deal with that protocol. Uh, and the, the Annex on Rules of Origin also refers to that uh, the dispute settlement protocol. So uh, the dispute settlement is there, but the lawyers can and deal with that better than us. And there's the other one, I didn't uh, get the name about the manual electronic certificates. Yes, there's a provision for electronic certificates, still goes back to the national preparedness at the country of export, whether they have their electronic uh, certificates. I know Mauritius has an electronic platform for electronic certificate issuance. I know SADC countries are also working on that electronic certificate. So if we have the platform, the, the Annex 2 on rules of origin, on proof of origin has that provision to allow you to do it electronically. And Dr. Sindhu talked about the integrated payment system. Uh, I think it is the money things, how the money are going to be transacted. Uh, you remember when I, I, I spoke to the milestone, I mentioned one of the, uh, the milestone, one of the instruments that there was a Pan-African uh, payment system. I remember I attended one of the webinars where the Secretary General talked too much about it and he explained a lot on the Pan-African payment system. I think that's the other way of trying to resolve this uh, money exchange or transaction or integration uh, problems. Uh, Mr. Okoto will uh, fill in for the questions maybe that I've left out. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Okoto, would you like to uh, add something? I think uh, UNAMI has uh, addressed all those. And uh, with the issue of uh, manual or electronic, like she said, it depends purely on the country involved. Like Ghana, we are ready for both, both uh, electronic and um, manual, depending on the destination country. If uh, they are capable of uh, accepting the electronic certificate, we issue the electronic certificate. If uh, they uh, can accept uh, uh, the manual, we issue the manual. And then with the payment system that she mentioned, it's been said a lot. If you are the last uh, 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 African uh, Ministers of Trade section, the uh, MD of Padre and Zimman make a, a presentation. I think it falls under, is it a adjustment policy at the Secretariat as well? It's uh, addressing these uh, payment systems. 
I'm sure when you go to the uh, website, you read on the adjustment policy, you see the payment system being developed by the African Zim Bank, uh, the, the where you can get a little more details into what is being developed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, thank you very much for the platform. Um, um, I'm Taliar from Namibia. Uh, okay, um, along the line, um, some of the issues that I wanted to ask were, 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 were touched on, but I just want to, 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 to highlight this um, very important issue of, uh, of access to information. Because um, if you look at, 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 at the AFTA itself, um, lately we have been presented with uh, all these you know, technical and, and legal uh, terminologies, you know, these and these, and it's, it creates a picture that, that a layman's person will think that this process is cumbersome, it's more bureaucracy again. I want to know, what has the state parties agreed on in terms of information dissemination? Because, you know, we are dealing with women, we are dealing with women in the informal sector, and most of them in the informal sector might be people with low literacy levels. How do we then ensure that state parties carry out these information through their mechanisms? Trading has started already. Some people, some people are still left behind because they just hear from TVs and so on that Africa, Africa, but they don't really know how to how they can partake in this thing. So I want to know from the experts really on this platform that I know countries, some countries have done well. Um, they have the capacity, but can, we cannot we cannot have one shoe fits all approach. Some countries like Namibia, we are still grappling with information and so on. So how do we ensure that everybody is on the same level at the same equity in in in, in, in Africa participation? Thank you. Thank you. Before we answer the question, let me also go to Musa uh, from Bank of Africa. Uh, you, you, Mr. Musa, uh, we have unmuted you. You can ask your question. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and well done for organizing the, this uh, 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 session. Uh, my question was, when Mr. Akoto was doing his presentation, he did indicate that a uniform certificate is being put together so that uh, at the various uh, countries, inspection will be done and to, uh, so, so as to uh, eliminate, uh, you know, uh, duplication or falsification of certificates. Is it not possible that we can have an online portal where if somebody comes and then in, uh, present a certificate or present his registration number, right away that one can be proved, can be verified. That is one. The other question that I have is that um, this initiative uh, is centered on women development. I mean, women entrepreneurs. Um, do we have any means or a program set aside to provide some sort of pool of funds for women in business to assess, uh, to support their business? These are the two questions that I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Before the- uh, Louis, before, before yeah. uh, there is a question on Facebook that relates to that. So okay. let me read that. And that's from Mary from also Bank of Africa. And she is asking that, it was mentioned that women entrepreneurs stand to benefit from the tariff reliefs. What is the criteria and procedure to enjoy these exemptions? So that ties into um, her colleague's question. All right, before the answers come, I want to know whether we, we still have Dr. Mangani. Because this question, some of them relate to you directly. Um, Mr. Chairman, let me try to respond to some of the issues. And I'll start with the last one on the women uh, uh, funds for the women asked by Mr. Musa. And then the one from the Facebook. Yes, uh, like uh, Mr. Chairman mentioned, uh, Dr. Mangeni should be responding to uh, uh, some of these issues. But uh, let me just try to explain that, like uh, I mentioned that uh, in my presentation that the focus is on women, youth, and uh, SMEs. So as far as I know, there is a unit being set up at the SG Secretary to uh, work on programs relating to women, youth, and uh, SMEs. 
but I cannot tell you that there's anything in place now. But uh, when the uh, uh, secretary takes off uh, completely, these issues are going to be addressed. And then uh, on the issue of um, the uniform certificates of origin, yes. Uh, it's just good that uh, we have a uniform certificate of origin so that we don't have a, uh, when you look at what we have in our various regs, they all have uniform certificates of origin. So also should after have a uniform certificate of origin. Uh, with regards to uh, uh, the issue of online verification, you know, we in customs, we have a way of uh, uh, doing our business. We expect to see certain documentation accompanying your consignment. Yes, so we expect to see an uploaded uh, uh, certified certificate of origin accompanying your consignment before we could work on it. But for us to go online uh, somewhere else to verify before we proceed, Probably that will be for uh, later times when the things uh, advance. But for now, we expect to see some of these certificates uploaded for our operations. And then the issue of uh, access to information. Yes, um, uh, uh, our brother Talia from uh, Namibia is a very important issue. Uh, it's a matter of concern that uh, information should go to everyone. And that depends on the various state parties. We in Ghana here, uh, let me just uh, tell you what has been done. Uh, the, our Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry has organized a lot of uh, seminars which involve the various category or, uh, 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 of uh, interest groups in our country participating. A very huge uh, seminar to bring awareness on this actor. And not just that, we have tried to put together certain information in various forms for dissemination to the various interest groups. So also can the various countries devise various means to reach out to their people I'm not saying what we have done in Ghana is enough. We're still planning to do more, to reach out to everyone. But uh, uh, for the secretary to do it, I wonder whether it will be possible now by it rests solely with the various member uh, uh, states or state parties. Uh, Unami, I believe you can add to it, please. Uh, program director, thank you, Mr. Gotta, for for answering uh, the other question. I'll try to run through the the chat questions that have been uh, uh, posed on the chat. Uh, there is a question that says, uh, "Is the, what is the potential conflict between AFCFTA rules of origin and those various uh, African regs, and how do customs authority decide on which rules to apply?" Uh, my answer is there is completely no conflict between the rules of origin of different of the AFCFT and other regs. Every trade agreement have its own set of rules of, of origin. rules of origin. Do the customs authorities have any problem, or will they decide? Absolutely not. Um, uh, uh, I must confess, I'm a customs officer as well, for working for my government here in Botswana there is no confusion whatsoever. As soon as the agreement uh, is, is ratified and the country is ready to, to, to trade in it, customs officials are trained, they're given information, they know what to do. So there is no, the systems are also ready. Uh, so there is no confusion whatsoever. As you have seen on that tariff book that I've showed, which had a uh, general rate, SADC and AFCFT, it's just like that, in, in, it's clear like that in customs. So no confusion whatsoever. And the other one question is saying, have, can we have the certificate of origin verification done online instead of manual? Absolutely up to the, uh, the, uh, the nation or the export or the import nation. 
whether they want to do their verification online or they want to do it in, on a written format, depending whether they have the infrastructure to do it online. But it will be beautiful to have it online. But as you all know, we are progressing, we are growing. So we are, we are, we are going towards the, the dream of Africa. So let us all work and patiently walk with it. Uh, I think th those are the ones that I've, I've picked from the from the, the chat. Dr. Mangeni, um, there, there has been a question more connected to you that says that, what, what's, uh, I remember the last time we visited the SG, <laughs> there was issue about women uh, that know traditionally it was not part of the protocol, but I know that you and the SG are working hard to get women inclusion, probably a protocol. There is a question about women. Is there a special, uh, uh, these tariff, uh, regime is it is it one tailored for women to help them really engage in uh, real trade? Over to you, Dr. Mangeni. The African continent of free trade area must be inclusive. For it to be inclusive, nobody should be left behind, and this means that all the vulnerable sectors of society, all the key sectors of society, must be on board and must benefit. And there must be interventions to ensure this. Now, these sectors include, among others, women, young Africans, micro, small to medium scale enterprises. So women, SMEs, and young Africans must also be on board. Um, I think all in all, we have spent our two hours and we wanted to stick to time. We will surely have uh, another of this type uh, will be announced. Uh, let me go to Dr. Joyce to give the vote of thanks for us for the special guests, guest speakers, distinguished participants that have uh, patronized this program. We have been oversubscribed. And we also want to apologize to those who could not join early, but next time we're going to look for a more powerful digital means of having about 500 membership at the same time. Dr. Joyce, over to you for the vote of thanks. Oh, thank you, Louise. And, um... I mean, the response has been very overwhelming. And um, for all our special guests from Her Excellency and our dear friend, uh, Mr. Salish, um, joining us from Jersey, and then Mr. Francis, um, who really has been very instrumental in joining us um, anytime we have our program, as well as our chairman, Mr. Joe Taki, whose wisdom and guidance continues to guide us, um, as well as our two very informative and expert speakers who have really thrown light on a very important topic. Um, Intra-African trade has been discussed and discussed, and it's just such a privilege to see it coming to life in our lifetime and I know that so many people waking up early in the morning or staying up late to join this webinar is a testament to the appetite and the need for um, AFCTA. And I know that we will all work diligently to ensure the success of AFCTA because it depends on all of us, every single one of us on this platform and also around the world. Um, I want to encourage you to continue to engage with us uh, through our platform on our website, um, afctapolicynetwork.org. Um, our subscriptions are there uh, for membership as well as a um, place for you to put your contact address so that we can um, invite you and also engage with you for future events. Um, again, thank all of you for your contribution, for your time, sh sharing your resources and knowledge with us. Um, have a good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever the time is in your part of the world. And we look forward to engaging with you very soon. The recording will be made available shortly and we will share that as well. Thank you. Thank you.